Um, this morning I want to share around the will of God. How, how can we know the will of God and how can we live it? Sometimes I fear we as Christians relate to the will of God as if it is a mystery. And sometimes even in, in the midst of our um, circumstances and decisions that we need to make, we often, when we are unsure, make a statement like something like, well, let's trust for the will of God to happen. As if we do not know what the will of God is. And, and what is very challenging is, is, is as we read the word of God, we discover that the will of God is not a mystery, but has been revealed to us. So that we can know and understand it, but also to live it. And so this morning I want to share around this concept of the will of God. How to know it and how to live it. I want to start off by Ephesians chapter 5. It says the following. You were once darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. How powerful is that? Find out what pleases the Lord and understand what His will is. So last week we spoke about purpose. What is our purpose and how do we find our purpose? And again we saw that the purpose of man... The reason we were created was to bring glory to God. And in that greater purpose of man, we find our individual purpose. And that is not what we do, but who we are. Purpose is not what we do, but how we do it that brings glory to God. And so too, the will of God is a universal will, but we find our individual will within that Universal will. Once we understand what is God's will for us universally, within that understanding, we start to grasp what's God's will for us as individuals. But first we need to start to understand what is the will of God. Ephesians 5 speaks of this concept that of, of purpose overlapping with last week. And if you've missed last week, please, you know, the sermons are for free. You can download it. But it speaks of this concept of where we used to be, and what we have become now that we are saved. And how we are meant to live as those who are saved. And so it says here, you were once darkness, but now you are the light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, and find out what pleases the Lord. You see, Christianity is primarily not about what is right and wrong. Christianity is about a relationship with God, that leads me to discover what pleases God and then living it for His glory. That's what Christianity is about. I want to do what pleases Him. And in doing so, living what pleases Him, He is glorified. And since our purpose is to glorify God, it is important that we not only know what pleases Him, but that we understand what His will is. Therefore, verse 17, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Not understanding the will of God is foolish. Because our purpose is to bring glory to God by living His will. And in that, find our fulfillment and purpose. Jesus so powerfully said in John chapter 4, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish his work my food that what sustains me is to do the will of God and to finish his work the context is so powerful as, as we know very well this was Jesus on his way through Samaria being tired and weak the disciples seeing Jesus weakness and finding some shade by a well encouraged Jesus asked him please you sit down here there's a little village, we will go and find some food. And while Jesus was waiting, we know this encounter with the woman at the well. And then when the disciples came back here, verse 31, in the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food of which you do not know. 
Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That what sustains me is to do the will of God. Therefore, we need to understand what is the will of God and do it. And in doing so, we ourselves will be sustained. Jesus teaches us to pray in Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. We know it so well. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need to ask God for His will to be done. Therefore, we must understand what this will is that we are asking for. But sometimes we live as if the will of God is a mystery. As if we do not know what it is. Hard to find and understand. Yet Ephesians 5 verse 17 says, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God is. Because we are meant to do the will of God, not understanding it will be foolish. And so Colossians 1 verse 9 says the following, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, the day of your salvation, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of, the, of His will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So we are not only to understand the will of God, we are meant to walk in it, fully pleasing God. And so we know Romans 12 verse 1 to 2 says the following, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is the good, acceptable and perfect. So again we see that by presenting ourselves as living sacrifices, renewing our minds, it is indeed possible to come to this place of discerning what the will of God is. What is the good, acceptable and perfect will of God? So the will of God is no longer a mystery, but an understanding and knowing and being fruitful in it. Again, the will of God is universal for, our, for all of us, and it is within that universal will that we find His individual will for us. But it is so important to understand that the will of God is not a mystery. As a matter of fact, from the beginning to the end of the Bible, we are exposed to the will of God. It's clearly revealed to us well, that what pleases Him and that what is unpleasing to God. But you know what? The modern theology has become so self-focused, it's all about the individual. My purpose, my calling, my destiny. And so we read in Mark 11 verse 24, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you have received them and you will have them. But because we are so self-focused, the things that we ask God for is all the things that we want. All the things that is necessary for our pleasure. And then not only do we ask God only for what we want, we even counsel God how we should do it. God, I'm struggling with this and I'm facing this and, and not only am I asking you to help you, I want you to do the following things so that I can be fulfilled. And therefore we read in James chapter 4, you ask and you do not receive. Because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So clearly what Jesus was speaking about, to ask and whatever we ask we will receive, is not literally meaning that whatever I ask I will receive. Because James make it very clear, you ask, you do not receive because you want to spend it on your leisure. So what did Jesus mean when he said we must ask and we will receive? And 1 John 5 clarifies that for us. He says, and this is the confidence that we have towards him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And we know that if He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that that what we have requested, that we have from Him. So, so, so it's not just whatever I want, 
but is when I ask according to His will, not my will, but His will that He hears and that I receive. Therefore, it is necessary to know and to understand what the will of God is and to seek that first. We need to realize that we can indeed understand and know the will of God. So where do we start? Where do we start to understand and know the will of God? To, to discover what pleases the Lord and living that. So where do we start? Well, I'll give you a clue. It's not the Bible. Even though the Bible from the beginning of end makes it very clear what is the will of God and what are the things that pleases Him. This is not where this process starts. The process of understanding the will of God starts in our hearts. It starts here. Our desire to know because we love Him. Not because we have to, but because we love Him. Because we realize what He has given us, this great salvation, and who we become in Christ, and this amazing inheritance, this promise that we have of eternal life with Him, being a co-heir with Christ. Because of this great love for me, and my acceptance of it, and my understanding of this, this undeserved grace, I want to know who you are and what pleases you to do that, because I love you. Because I want to do what you want. But the question is, do we really want to know? Do we really want to understand the will of God? Do we really want to know what pleases Him? Or are we following God for what He can do for us and not for who He is? Like the, like the Israelites in, in, in John chapter 6. Where Jesus multiplied the, the two fish and the five loaves and, and he fed 5,000. And when, and when the people saw that, they were so excited, they wanted to make Jesus king by force. And Jesus, seeing that, left them and gone up to the mountains and in the middle of the night walked across the water to get into the boat to get to the other side. And those people so zealous for Jesus, for what he has done for them, looking to make him king, searching all over, couldn't find him. And finally, when they got to the other side, their first question was, Jesus, how did you get here? And Jesus responds to this, Most assuredly, I tell to you, you did not come to me because of the sign of who I am. You came to me because you ate of the bread and are full. You come looking for me, not for who I am, but for what I can do for you. And I say to you, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And he offended them all. Because they were looking, they were following him for what he could do for them and not for who he is. And so the mystery of the will of God is not a mystery for those who follow God for who he is. It's because I love you that I want to know. And so it starts in my heart. And then to the Word, to read it, to understand it, to know it, because I want to know, I want to understand. And it's from that place where God brings revelation. And understanding, it's not even revelation, it is so plain in the Word. But the question is, do we really want to? Because it's not about what is right and what is wrong, it's about what pleases the Lord. That's what Christianity is about. Motivated not by obligation, but out of a love for God. You know, I've got two daughters, Janine and Danielle. The one is 11 and the other one is 13 and they're beautiful girls. And I love them very much. And they know one of the things that I don't like is a nose ring. Yeah? I, I don't like it. It's not a sin. It's not wrong. I don't judge anybody that has one. I just don't like it. And they know it. They know I don't like it. And, and while they're still young and they're living in my house, they cannot do whatever they want. But one day when they are 18, they will have more freedom to do whatever they please. But let's imagine Danielle decides to study from home and still lives in my home, in my house. Full knowing that her father doesn't like the nose ring. But now she has a choice. And so she decides, full knowing that I don't like it. It's not a sin. It's not against the law. She has a choice. But full knowing that I don't like it, she gets a nose ring. 
Is she doing it for me? Or is she doing it for herself? What does it say about her love for me? You know, and sometimes as Christians, we do the same. We try to find all the loopholes between what is right and what is wrong. What are the gray areas? How can I circumvent what is clearly said? But it's not about what's right and what is wrong. It's beyond that. It's far more than that. It's about what pleases the Lord. You see, if it's only about what is right and wrong, I'm only going to do the minimum. But if it is about what pleases Him, I'm going to do over and above what is right and wrong. Because I want to do what is pleasing to you. Not just what is the minimum. Re- religion is about the minimum requirement. But the relationship with God is what pleases you. And from that place, motivated by love, because I love you, I want to do the things that pleases you. My daughters know that I do not want them to marry an unbeliever. They know that. Often I tell them, there's one thing, my girls, you must know I'm going to be part of the process of choosing your husband. Make peace with that. You can only marry when you're 30. Uh, not really. <laughs> but they know, they know that I'm not going to give my blessing to an unbelieving man. He can be as handsome, he can have a 12-pack, he can have a great job and good manners, but if he doesn't love the Lord, I will not give my blessing. They know that. Why do I say that? Is it because I'm old-fashioned and stuck up? No. I say that because I know that is the will of God. We read of it in 2 Corinthians 6. It says, and and I want to tell you girls, if you're here and you're still unmarried, if if you meet this handsome, amazing guy that is not a Christian, and you want to ask God, is it your will that I marry him? I can tell you now it's God's will. No. It's not his will. It will not please him if you do. You will not go to hell. You will not lose your salvation. But it doesn't please him. And yes, we can find loopholes and justifications on, yes, but I know this couple who did that, and then the husband did get saved, and and what an amazing testimony how they both serve and love the Lord. Yes, but does it please the Lord? Your choice. No. Why? Because he says so. It's not a mystery. It says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Or what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what communion has light with darkness? Or what accord is Christ with Baal? Or what part is a believer with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as He has said, powerfully, as He has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, because of this great and awesome promise, therefore, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. What an amazing promise. Even more so for us as Gentiles. You know, when we read the Old Testament and we read about Israel, we read as if we are Israel. We are not Israel. We are the Philistines. We are the Gentiles. The amazing grace of salvation is that God through Christ has reconciled the Gentile and the Jew to God. We don't deserve any mercy. We're the guys that God sends to destroy. But through His grace and mercy, we can now become part of this amazing promise. And God becomes our Father and we become His sons and daughters. And then it says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Because of these great promises, because of the love and mercy and grace of God, our response is to perfect holiness. Get rid of anything that defiles body and spirit. Not out of obligation, but because out of love and revelation. 
It's not just about what is right and wrong, about watching this show. Is it, is it acceptable? Is it not acceptable? You know, how much nakedness is in it? You know, is it a full boob, a half a boob? What is it? No, it's not about whether it's permissible or not. It's, does this please the Lord for me to be exposed to this? And the answer is, no. So now let's try and find a loophole and a justification. Let's, because of our love for God, find out what pleases Him and do that. And, and let's, because we know what pleases the Lord is, is holiness, let us pursue not a pass rate. Not 51%. Oh, well, you, what is it now? 41%. <laughs> Let's pursue 100. Out of the love of God. Not because we have to, but because we want to, because we know that was pleasing the Lord. It's not about whether there's a loophole or a justification. No, it's not about right and wrong. It's about what pleases the Lord. So we live in a way... So what is the will of the Lord? It's not a mystery. Because God is now my Father, and I am now His Son, there is nothing more precious than that. My salvation, my acceptance, my inheritance. I will do whatever my Father desires. I will cleanse myself from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, and I will pursue perfection in holiness, not out of legalism, out of love, because you are more precious than anything else. I love you more than anything this world can offer, anything this world can tempt me with, it is nothing compared to who you are and what you have given me. And because of this great love for me, I want to do what pleases you. Not because I have to, but because I want to. Because I love you more. I love you more than this world. I love you more than the things in the world. I, I love you more than what this world tempts and offers me. And therefore we read 1 John 2.15 and it makes sense from this place where it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the pride of life is not of the Father but of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. How powerful. So yes, we can know and understand the will of God. And we can live in a way that pleases Him. Both is motivated by the love for God. My separation from the world and everything that defiles it. And my pursuit of doing what pleases the Lord. It's motivated by love. Perfecting holiness is a pursuit not out of a religious mindset, but out of a love for God. Perfecting holiness, I cannot do in my own strength either. But I have this aim that I know that pleases the Lord. And so I ask Him to help me to do what He desires me to become. So I ask Him, Lord, help me to control my tongue. Help me to control my thought life. Help me to turn away from the things that I know is not pleasing to You. God, in myself, I cannot do this. But I'm asking You, according to Your will, because I know Your will for me is to perfect holiness. So I'm asking You, God, help me to become what You desire me to be. And I know that you hear me because I know I'm asking what you desire. And whatever you hear, you give accordingly. That's why, when I want to ask the band to come up, that's why 1 John 5 verse 14 says, 
And this is the confidence we have towards Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And we know that if He hears us, we have that what we have requested of Him. Because I'm not asking just what I want. I'm asking what He wants. And I'm not saying we cannot ask God for things that we also want. God says, bring everything to me. Ask me. But there is a difference between my will and His will. I think one thing that I had to discover is that I am not the center of the universe. And Jesus didn't come to die for Andres. He didn't. He came to die for the church, of which I have the privilege to be part of. And He's not coming back for Andres either. He's coming back for the church. And I pray that I'm there when He returns. But the universe is not going to stop if Andres is not in the church. It's a privilege. It's amazing. I'm not worthy. I'm not worth anything. You can do everything you want without me. Yet you choose to use me. Yet you choose to save me. What a privilege. So I don't want to live for what I want. My life is gone. You saved me. And I belong to you. I, I, I want to serve you. Because of what you have given me. It's like Jesus in the garden when he said, Father, all things are possible for you. If it's possible, take this cup away from me. But nevertheless, not my will be done. Your will be done. For my food, what sustains me? It's not what I want, it's what you want. It's to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And as people, it's not a mystery. Ask Him to show you what pleases Him. Ask Him to give you understanding into His will. Ask Him to help you to do what you see and hear. And ask Him to change you more and more into the image and likeness of His Son for His glory. And because we love God, we make this our pursuit. To understand His will and to know what pleases Him, to ask Him to help us to live it to the full. So it's not about what's right and wrong. It's about what pleases the Lord. It's not about finding loopholes and justifications. It's about loving God and responding to His love. I want to know what pleases you and live that. I'm running out of time and I want to leave you with this question. What is the will of God? What is that what pleases Him? I'm not going to give you the answer to those questions today. Because if you really love Him, you don't need me to tell you that. You can go and discover it yourself. It's there. It's so off. It's, it's. We even have it in our own language. You don't need to try and figure out the Greek or the Hebrew. It's there. And in finding it, you, you will find fulfillment. You will find meaning. When you start to live it, it will sustain your life. And you will have joy and peace. That surpasses all understanding. Jesus says something powerful in Mark chapter 3. His mother and brothers were looking for him, and he was ministering with people who were hungry, who were thirsty, who wanted to know the will of God. And the house was packed, and they couldn't get in because there were just so many people hungry and thirsty for God. And so they sent somebody to call Jesus. And so we read his mother and brothers came standing outside and sent it to him and called him. And the crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? 
and looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. How powerful is that? Yes, you can know the will of God. And you can live it. And be in this place of intimacy with Him. Let us pray together. Father, we thank You for Your love for us. We thank You for sending Your Son, giving Your Son, sacrificing Him to save us, to redeem us. We who were still enemies, dead in our trespasses, not a people having no future, no inheritance. You redeemed us, God, called us to Yourself, gave us Your Spirit and this promise of an inheritance for eternity. What a great God. What an awesome God. What an amazing, gracious, loving Father You are. Lord, I pray that You'll open our eyes to see Grant us the spirit of revelation and understanding to know what is this, this hope of your calling, this, this riches of this inheritance and the succeeding greatness of your power within us. That it may become a treasure more valuable than anything in this world, what this world can offer. That we will be willing, Lord, to forsake everything to buy the land in which this treasure is, that this treasure may be ours. It's not about money. It's about our hearts. It's not about the land. It's not about a physical treasure. It's about you. That you may become the most precious thing to us. And so, Lord, I pray that we may see, that we may understand it, that we may live it. I want to give you an opportunity just as you are seated that you just respond to God. Whatever the Lord has laid on your heart, whatever stood out for you in the sermon, just speak to the Lord yourself. Just speak to Him. Maybe you are here this, this morning and while all the eyes are closed. You know there are things in your life that is not pleasing to the Lord. Maybe you have walked in places you should not have walked. Maybe you have touched things. Maybe you've looked at things. Maybe you are doing things that you know are not pleasing to the Lord. And today... The Lord is speaking to you. Come out from among them. Do not touch what is unclean. But understand my will. Find out what is pleasing to me. If that is you and, and, and you just want to you just want to turn away, you want to repent from the things that you are trapped in. Maybe you have justified, maybe you found a loophole. But today you want to turn your heart to God and say, God, I want to pursue holiness. And turn away from everything that defiles body and spirit. If that is you, and you want to repent, you want to have freedom from these things, just raise your hand just where you are. just want to pray with you. Thank you for your hands. Thank you. you can just drop it, put it up, drop it again. It's just between you and the Lord. It's just a response to Him. Father, I want to thank you for each and every person, Lord, in their hearts that is making a decision today, Lord, to pursue you out of love for you. God, I pray that you will show them, reveal to them more of your love, but also 
an understanding of your will and what pleases you, God. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will set them free from the lies and the lure and, and the deception of this world. That you'll open their eyes to see its emptiness and see the fullness that you have. Lord, we come against any strongholds, any addictions, any patterns in Jesus' name. And we break that and we say, be free in Jesus' name. Free, not to do what you want, but to do what He wants. And Lord, I pray for a passion and a zeal, Lord, to pursue holiness, to perfect it. So that you may be glorified. And God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come in each and one of us, Lord, that you will fill us by your Spirit, that you will empower us, because we cannot do this in our own strength. But you can. What is impossible for man is possible for you. And so I ask, God, that you will empower us by the power of your Holy Spirit to become vessels of honor, living sacrifices, being transformed more and more into the image of your Son that you may be glorified. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity, if you're here today, to make a stand and say, Today, God, I choose to accept, to embrace, and to receive this amazing gift of salvation. And I want to give you my life and follow you and know this fullness that there's only in Christ. If that is you and you want to surrender your life, just raise your hand. Is there anybody here? Thank you for that hand. Is there anyone else? Is there anyone else? Father, I thank you for hearts responding to you. Thank you, Lord, for this, this man that has chosen today to accept you. To accept this amazing grace, this, this expression of love. Lord, I pray that you will bless him, that you will renew him, Father. I know he's become a new creation in Christ Jesus as he chooses to accept you, to humble himself before you and say, God, I am a sinner, but you saved me. And I want to thank you for this today. As you gave your life for me, I will give you my life. And I will follow you all the days of my life. God, I pray that you will fill him with your spirit, Lord, that you will open his eyes and his heart and his mind to see what you have done for him. Lord, I pray that you will show him and teach him, Lord. Make him new and change him to become more like you. For your glory. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for us that we will leave this place not the same, but that we will seek not what is right and wrong, but what pleases you, and that we will live that for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.